even if you're buying something that isn't quite exactly what you envision that you would like to have, because we get this idea of, of buying a, a profitable platform. Once you have a business that is making money for you and it contains a lot of the resources that you need for whatever it is that you really would like to do, you can then build that new thing, that new concept on top of that existing business and you've basically have given yourself infinite runway because you're already making money from day one. You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm your host, Kerry Lutz. As we get to the dog days of August, you might be thinking, what should I be doing? Should I start a new business? Should I buy a business? You got some extra cash. You want to do it in the least risky way possible. However, you want to get the maximum return. And someone who's an expert in that, he hasn't been on the show in more than half a decade, is David Barnett. David's uh, got about 12 books out there, I think. And uh, hey, your latest book, Smarter Than a Startup, but among them, it's How to Sell My Own Business. I did that. Invest Local, Credit Card Advantage, 12 Things to Do Before You Consider Selling Your Business, and a bunch of other books too. David, it's great to have you back on the show. Hey, Carrie, it's great to be here. How are you today? Oh, excellent. So uh, looking at your latest book, uh, you kind of tip your hand in the title, Smarter Than a Startup. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So, you know, there, a lot of people want to get into business and there's an awful lot of content out there about, you know, starting a business and what it's like to start a business, how to plan to start a business. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of the book was simply to give people a pro and con of why it might make more sense to look at buying a business instead of starting one even if somebody has some kind of unique and creative idea. And this is the key because I've witnessed this in my own career where someone has wanted to start a new kind of business and maybe the, the market was improving or uh, they didn't really know what the demand was going to be. And so you, as you can imagine, starting a business like that entails even more risk than the average business startup. And so what I've seen people do successfully is buy existing profitable businesses that just happened to contain some of the resources they needed for this new idea that they had. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like the idea is to acquire a business that can provide an incubation base for the new idea that you want to explore. And it's all about reducing risk at the end of the day. All right. So I've started businesses. Most of the businesses I've been in started from the ground up, but I've done a few turnarounds. And I can tell you that uh, it's easier to do a turnaround to buy an existing business, even if it's marginally profitable or losing some money, a little bit, not humongous losses, but manageable losses. And uh, and then to turn it around because, you know, when you start a new business, you got to have a system for everything. And even though systems are easier than ever because of the cloud-based applications out there, like QuickBooks Online, like, uh, so, like CRMs, uh, client, uh, you know, management systems. Uh, even with all that, it's easier to get a company that's running, all right, that has that has uh, dollars coming in the door, even if they're doing things wrong, than it is to start from the ground up. Well, yeah, and I think the 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 thing that you're pointing out there is that one of the most difficult things to get in business is the dollars coming through the front door. And it's, it's that race to get enough customers fast enough that many new startups lose and they don't mm -hmm. quite get to the point they need to, to hit that break-even point. Or I like to point out that, you know, once you hit the break-even point and you're breaking even, you really haven't broken even because then you got to recover all the losses that you put into it over the course of time that it took you to get to that point. And so it, it really is an uphill battle. It, it's hard to get a new business up and off the ground successfully. Yeah, and uh, very few people are able to keep them going five years or more, right? Yeah, it's true. And so so this is why in the book I, I propose the idea of instead of starting, you should be looking at buying, 
even if you're buying something that isn't quite exactly what you envision that you would like to have, because we get this idea of, of buying a, a profitable platform. Once you have a business that is making money for you and it contains a lot of the resources that you need for whatever it is that you really would like to do, you can then build that new thing, that new concept on top of that existing business. And you've basically given yourself infinite runway because you're already making money from day one. Um, you know, people will say, well, what about the money? It costs a lot of money to buy a business. And the fact is that when you buy an existing business that is already profitable, it opens the door to a lot more in the way of financing opportunities because lenders can see that the business can afford to make repayments. It's, it's when you start something new that you have no proven track record or no cash flow to, to look at. This is, this is difficult. And, you know, if you've got money accumulated that you're going to use in your startup effort, you can very often parlay that money into doing an acquisition. So, uh, what, uh, are there any particular sectors that you like right now that, um, that if you were looking to start a business or buy one, you would be looking at? I'm a big fan of that uh, cliche, the niche, the riches are in the niches. And so I always tell people that as far as I'm concerned, one of the best things you can do is look for businesses that don't have a high degree of visibility. So industries that are not really front and center and very public all the time. Uh, and look for industries where you're able to get healthy margins and you can protect them in large part because other people just don't happen to notice. You know, mm -hmm. a very public, very front stage kind of business that is doing well will attract attention and ultimately attract new competitors. Um, it, it's a function of capitalism. Hey, what do you think of the property management space? I like property management. Um, and one of the big reasons why I like it is because it's a service business with little in the way of, of capital assets. You basically are making a real estate play without having to invest in real estate. Right mm -hmm. now, it's competitive, and you have to have great systems and and execution. But if you can do the job correctly, and your customers are happy, uh, they'll probably stick with you. Um, it's one of those businesses where where oftentimes um, it's not because someone else comes along and steals your client from you that you lose a client. Mm -hmm. It's because you did something to upset your customer, and, and a lot of the times I've I've worked with people in, in similar industries where. They'll describe their sales cycle as waiting for their competitors to mess up, you know, and, and creating an opportunity for them to come in. I was going to say that. So like with property management, people are always upset, especially, you know, there's just a huge level of dissatisfaction for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of them aren't doing what you should be doing here, right? So really they're pulling customers away isn't a big deal because most of the customers are looking anyway because they're dissatisfied with their existing company. Well, you know, I've got some experience in this because I used to own apartments. And uh, I remember um, I was looking at different management companies and then the one I chose, they really blew me away because they, they had a, a, and this was over 10 years ago, but they had a really up-to-date system. So they would send me these detailed reports at the beginning of the month showing the collections and everything they had spent on. And every time they got, uh, you know, calls from tenants about certain issues, um, I was kind of kept in the loop with a CC email. And mm -hmm. so uh, I knew what was going on and I was always informed. I didn't feel like I was in the dark. And, and it, as in any sales or any kind of customer service management, uh, setting expectations is the number one thing, isn't it? And so if you keep setting expectations and letting people know what's going on, it's going to be harder for them to be upset with you. Yeah. And that's great. They had a system in place, although too much information could drive you a little batty, but maybe that's the idea. They just dump so much on you that you wind up just ignoring it and saying they're doing their job until you find out otherwise. Hey, what about this concept of buying a franchise? Well, yeah. One of the other books that I, that I wrote a few years ago was actually called Franchise Warnings. And uh, it's one of the few books out on Amazon that actually talks about some of the downsides to the franchise business model. There, there's a lot of success in the world of franchising. Um, you really have to look at what you're getting for your money. Um, you know, it, when you start a new franchise location, you're dealing with a lot of the same issues that a new startup has. You have to get customers that are being served presumably by someone else right now. So you still have to fight for that in the front door revenue. Uh, you still mm -hmm. have to find your place in the market. And on top of it all, you've got almost an extra layer of government over your head. You know, the, the franchisor takes a cut off the top 
and can dictate to you how and when you do things and when you need to spend money on upgrades or improvements mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And so it works very well for some people. If you're super creative and innovative and very entrepreneurial, it may not be a good option because you have to very much color within the lines when you're part of a franchise network. But for some people, you know, if you've got background and experience of living within someone else's rule set, it, it can work out. All right. So, yeah. Uh, what about buying an existing franchise location that's already producing income? It, it, you know, that, that's actually one of the suggestions that I put in my book, Franchise Warning. So I'll say, if you really are in love with a certain franchise brand, the best of both worlds is to find an existing location that's up for sale because then you can actually get a peek at its its actual track record, right? And it's already got the performance in place. And it's interesting because resales in the franchise world will sell just like this, just like any other independent business will sell for. The price is a function of the cash flow. Whereas in new location, the price is a function of what it costs to build and open. And it's interesting because within many franchise systems, you can often find resale units that are cheaper to buy than opening a brand new unit. Yeah, because it could be millions of dollars to open the unit, right? Hundreds of it thousands. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Especially especially with some of these big physical location type franchises like restaurants and things like that. You can spend a ton of money. Um, on real estate improvements in buildings that you don't own. And you've got to recoup that money over the life of your operation. And, um, you know, the capital expense can be can be quite high. That's true. Yeah. All right. So what about financing? Uh, you want to do this business, you want to buy it. Banks are pulling back now, as we've seen from the banking crisis. Uh, so that's putting a squeeze on people, isn't it? Well, it's becoming more and more difficult. You know, there in the United States anyway, there's still a great deal of SBA financing being done on business acquisitions. Mm -hmm. If the deal cash flows, bankers will make the loans. The challenge for a lot of sellers is that, um, you know, they want the prices that people were getting in 2021. And the reality is that with these higher interest rates, buyers just can't afford that. The, the cost of the money, the higher interest payments have to come out of the cash flow of the business. And most prudent buyers are pricing in even higher interest rates. SBA 7A loans are variable. And so people buying today are being quoted 10, 10.5% by their bankers. Right. And I know people are planning for another couple points of increase. So this means they can't afford to pay as much as they used to. Um, I know that some deals are falling apart because of that. But you know, I believe that for those sellers, they're not really paying attention. It could be that their business may be worth even less down the road if these rates continue to go up. Yeah, probably uh, they'll never get more money for their business than they'll get right now, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it, 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 hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? And uh, 2021 was a fantastic year for people to exit. There were all kinds of government programs who were taking advantage of and interest rates were low, meaning buyers could pay top dollar. Um, you know, you've got a, a, a powerful entity out there, you know, the, the central bank who is actually trying to create a recession. Um, and I, I don't know why people don't pay attention to that. But usually yeah. what those guys want, they get. You, you think they'll be successful in uh, creating the recession they're looking for? I think they're going to try until they get it. <laughs> until they get the right formula, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they're trying to get inflation under control. All right. So... You've been at this game for a while, David. Going back, if you could go back to yourself twenty at age 21, what would you tell yourself? At age 21? That's, that's a great question, Carrie. I would probably not change anything. You know, mm. the, the, the path that I've been on that has led me to where I am today has been a pretty good one. Um, I probably would have told myself to buy Briex and sell at 100. How about that? Uh, that would probably have been good advice back then. I would have told myself to buy Tesla and never sell it. At least. <laughs> uh, but in any event, hindsight's twenty twenty. But as far as maybe you could have done things quicker, more profitably, avoided some mistakes. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's interesting because every time I want to look back at something with a bit of regret, I realize that part of what I learned in that period of my life is valuable to, to me now. And uh, I, maybe, maybe that's the lesson. Right. It's just no matter what you live through, you know, look for the value that you're generating for yourself. It, it's funny today, yeah. you know, 
Uh, I promote myself on YouTube and, and for example, and, you know, earlier in my life, I was actually on the radio. And so part of that experience helps me today. Um, you know, I went through a career of owning a business brokerage office. It was a crazy up and down roller coaster of cash flow. It gave me all the gray hair I have, but living through that experience gave me the knowledge and understanding that I need today to do the consulting work that I do. And so I think as long as you are learning and developing yourself, even if things seem rough, take what you can out of it. The, um, there's a, uh, a a great book, you know, Gene Simmons, uh, the bass yeah. player there for yes. Kiss. He's got right. that great, he's got a book called Me Inc. in which he describes his own journey back and forth between self-employment and employment, you know. And his advice to people is to always be doing things that develop yourself and take a job if you can develop yourself and learn something from it, build upon that in your next enterprise. And I, I had just thought that book was amazing. And uh, I would I would repeat the same kind of sentiment, you know, that you live through things and, and you learn along the way. Yeah, well, hey, uh, my father always used to say, anytime you go into a new business, you're going to pay for lessons right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you're either going to pay with time or money. One of the two. But you're going to pay, right? Yeah. So, uh, hey, your top, just before we go, top three businesses, segments, industries, if you will, that you would be looking at if you were going to buy a business now. If I was going to buy a business, I would be looking at, again, things that cannot be delivered by Amazon. Number one, so you don't want to be competing against these big trend trends in the marketplace. So something that can't be delivered by Amazon, I would be looking at something that could leverage AI at the small business level. Mm -hmm. So AI is being put into everything right now. You know, uh, big companies are using it in a lot of different ways. And so if you're in the world of small business trying to compete with big companies, you're probably going to be at a disadvantage. But if there is some reason why your industry is always going to be dominated by small business, people like yourself, a vastly diversified ownership of enterprises, then you want to look for something where you're going to be able to employ AI. So think about something like auto repair. There's always going to be auto repair. It's likely always going to be small, local, independent businesses. But is there oh, you know, something like auto repair where AI could come in and really help you? if you're open to it and open to experimenting and implementing new things quickly. So that would be the second thing. And the third thing, like I mentioned before, is good margins. Um, you know, gross margin is probably the most important line on the, on the P&L. And too many people, I think, um, don't understand that. You can get into a lot of trouble in business if you don't understand your margins, understand where you should be for your industry and defend that margin properly. Or, or build a reason why people want to or choose to or need to keep doing business with you over competitors. Right. All right. Well, hey, David, really appreciate you coming on. Tell us where we find you, how we connect with you on the web these days. Sure. I can always be found at davidcbarnett.com. That's my blog site. There's an email list there that people can sign up to. And if you're interested in learning more about buying, selling, financing, or managing small and medium-sized businesses, my YouTube channel has over 600 videos, almost entirely created by questions that people have submitted. Uh, and uh, I put the audio of that onto the podcast feed. So if you just look up David Barnett, small business, you'll find me. All right. Excellent. The link is in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Make sure you click it while you're there. Go sign up for your free newsletter. David, always enlightening, always interesting speaking with you, learning th things about businesses that I didn't know. We will definitely talk to you again, and we won't let half a decade or more go by. That sounds good, Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.